In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Thank you all very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come. I know it's a distance and I know it's a sacrifice and it's not easy to come on a Friday night. And uh, we're very, very thankful to have you. And uh, we thank uh, uh, St. Mark's Church for hosting. We thank Abuna Samuel and Abuna Pavlos for hosting us. We're very, very delighted to, to serve you all. And we're your servants. We want to... We want to encourage you to take marriage seriously. We do a lot of things passively in life, right? When you go to the doctor, for example, you have an appointment, you kind of show up and the doctor takes over and he does things to you and pulls things from you and pokes you and prods you and asks you questions and then you just kind of respond. There are lots of things we do in life passively. But marriage cannot be passive. Marriage is a sacrament. It's a spiritual union between man and wife. And in that case, there is necessarily an opposing force against you, your enemy the devil. If you want to go to war passively, you will lose. If you want to enter into war in this world, aggressively, proactively, purposefully, you're going to win because you have the authority in Christ to overcome the enemy. But don't go walking in to marriage thinking that it's just all passive because if you do, you're going to be disappointed. We need to enter into the marriage sacrament with our eyes open and if we do that, we're going to have a great marriage. If we work hard at our relationship, we're going to have a great marriage and a great family life and we're going to be blessed. There are three subjects that uh, Debbie and I are going to share with you. The first tonight is on spiritual intimacy. Tomorrow morning, God willing, we'll be speaking about um, empathy and um, safety. And following that, we'll talk about keeping your family safe. And the, and the subject on keeping your family safe is broad and covers many subtopics, but we hope that you'll find them useful. So tonight, we're going to look at spiritual intimacy. Now before we get started, we have a little exercise for you. And uh, we hope that you'll bear with us. We have a mission for you. We're going to ask you to stand up for this mission, should you choose to accept it, and decipher this code. Now here's the thing, you need to stand up, okay, if your partner is not yet here, it's no problem, but we need, if your partner is here, you need to separate from your partner, you need to be about 10 feet from your partner, and I need you to take about a minute to decipher this mission. Stand up. up Everybody up, up. stand up. Everybody stand 60 up. 60 seconds. Separate 10 feet from your spouse if your spouse is here. 10 feet. You can be, just don't be close to your spouse. And the two of you need to look at this here, this message on the screen, and strive to decipher the code. Starting now. Just, this is your mission. Have at it. Ten second warning. Five second warning. Time's up. All right. Sit back down. 
be sure to get back with your uh, spouse. <clears throat> Was anybody able to crack the code? We have a code cracker. What's the answer? But Very good. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> Get the group leader to leave the room. Tracy, do you want to tell us how you got the answer? That's right. That's Very right. Good. Right? So the letter G precedes the letter H, right? The letter E precedes the letter F, right? T precedes U. H, F, U, get. U, I, F is the. Okay? Very good. Very good. Now, here's the thing. Here's the question. What were the barriers to deciphering this code? Why was this not easy? Let me hear from you guys. Do we have another mic? Can we have a runner? I need a mic volunteer, a runner volunteer who will run the mic. You mind? Yeah, you can use this one for now. Here we go. Thank you. So, so, can I get a volunteer? What, to name a barrier, what was the barrier to deciphering the code? I want to move. Maggie, behind you. It just looked unfamiliar. It was unfamiliar. Very good. What else? Well, why was it unfamiliar? I mean, these are these are English letters. We've seen these before. What was what was unfamiliar about it? The way they were grouped was unfamiliar. The way they were grouped. <laughs> okay. Could you all see the screen? Not everybody could, or could you all? Okay. Would it have helped if you had been able to confer with your partner, have another person to confer with? You know, some of you say, no, my husband had done me no good. <laughs> or my husband, my wife messed me up. I was going to give you the right <laughs> answer, and she told me something else. Okay. Did you have any instructions? No. I didn't give you any instructions. Just told you to decipher the code. Okay. Did you feel like you had enough time? No, you didn't have enough time either. All right, it was clearly a, a different language, right? All right. Now let me ask you this. Before you got married, do you think that you were able to walk in and know what you were getting into? Raise your hand if you knew what you were getting into before you got married. And is it what you thought? Were you right? Okay. Very good. You're a minority. Because <laughs> you didn't have instructions. Right? Not or maybe much. you did. Not much. Right? And when you speak to your spouse, different language, uh, sometimes I can honestly tell you I don't understand my wife. And sometimes she can attest to the fact that she doesn't understand me. That's true enough. What, to be more specific, are the barriers to spiritual intimacy? Well, should we back up? What's spiritual intimacy? Yeah, let's define it. What do you, what do you guys think? What, what, is, what does it mean, spiritual intimacy? We're going to start calling on people. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> to be uh, extremely connected and basically one spiritually. All right. Okay. One spiritually. That sounds very zen. Anybody want to build on that? Because we often know what intimacy means. Like intimacy, okay, go ahead, yeah. To 
have similar spiritual goals and intensity of, um, I don't know, trying to get there. I'm, I'm lost for words. But, you know, like you can both sort of, sort of generally, you know, want to go to heaven, but are you both taking it seriously? What does that translate into? What does that translate into in a practical sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody in this room, nobody wants to go to hell, but I mean, is everybody taking that goal seriously? And what does that mean? And why, why don't you want to go to hell or why do you want to go to heaven? Okay. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? Spiritual intimacy. Like we talked last year, I think it was, we talked about physical intimacy. Okay, we've talked sometimes about emotional intimacy. So what's the difference? What, what, what defines spiritual intimacy? Which we've kind of hit on it already a little bit. Um, is there anything else that you guys want to add about spiritual intimacy? Sherry? Um, maybe sharing in God's love with one another. Sharing in God's love with one another, okay. me, did you have something? Oh, okay. Over there. Pete? It's like when you say that two become one flesh, where one direction and one hurts, one hurts, the other hurts, one is joyful, the other is joyous. Connection of emotion and mind and direction. Okay, so there's a connection, um, a unity. Okay. Let's look at really spiritual intimacy from the perspective of God. If I'm going to be spiritually intimate, first and foremost, I need to be intimate with who? My creator, God. I need to be intimate with God. My spouse, there she is on this side of my arm, she needs to be intimate with God. She's intimate with God. I'm intimate with God and then I can be intimate with her who's my connection who's my who's my connection I don't have a board wish I could God is my connection right God is at the top and if I could connect three dots I'd connect her to God and me to God and I would see that God is the connection I have spiritual intimacy when she's connected to God and I'm connected to God. And when the two of us are made one in the sacrament of, sacrament of marriage. Now, I also need intentional spiritual intimacy, not just default spiritual intimacy, right? Intentional spiritual intimacy is where my spouse and I make a decision together to be focusing our heart and our minds on Jesus Christ. We're focusing our hearts and our minds on Jesus Christ. Together, Doing as a couple, together. as a family. We've made a decision. We're going to be intentional about it. And we're going to be headed in the direction of God. Right? Now, if you assume that is our definition of spiritual intimacy. Tell me, what do you think very practically are the barriers that we experience on a daily basis to achieving spiritual intimacy? Day-to-day -day distractions. Busy schedules. Day-to-day -day distractions. Busy schedule. Very good. Very good example. I get up in the morning. I have to be someplace. Where do I have to be? I have to be probably at work, right? Or class, right? Or both, right? I have to take care of the children. The children wake me up in the morning, right? I have to take care of their needs before I take care of mine. Sometimes I do that, right? What about stress? stress a barrier to spiritual intimacy? <laughs> so, you see, we have barriers to spiritual intimacy on an hourly basis, right? If we don't recognize 
what those barriers are, we might not be able to effectively overcome them. Also, some of the spiritual barriers or some of the barriers that we have to our intimacy are, are barriers that we cannot see. Sometimes we have attacks from our enemy, the devil, which is a real present danger in our marriage. Sometimes our enemy, the devil, can incite us against one another and can incite us against our God. He doesn't hesitate to bring temptations into our lives, right? That is a barrier to spiritual intimacy. The devil will attack either my connection with God or my spouse's connection with God or our connection with one another. That's where the devil strikes. So, if we go back to the icebreaker, okay? The icebreaker, we actually had to do this exercise at a retreat once too, and we actually found it pretty annoying because we felt like the same as you guys did. We felt like you, you're not giving us instructions. We don't know what to do. You just put this thing in front of us and tell us, go, figure it out, right? Okay, so we said not enough time. First of all, there wasn't enough time. And, and that in an instance marries, er, it, it mirrors our marriages in a sense because you know marriage is a lifetime commitment and sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking that we're going to go into it and we're automatically going to be intimate emotionally we're going to be intimate physically and we're going to be intimate spiritually and everything's going to be just fine because the sacrament has been performed but that's not the way that God designed it God designed it for the whole lifetime and so it has to grow and develop over time so this not enough time was one of our barriers and then um, too far apart okay we have you separate from each other for a few feet and I don't know about you guys you guys I don't know I couldn't quite see what was going on all that well but um, I know that when we did this exercise in the room some of the couples were not wanting to talk to each other because they were kind of competing with the couples next to them and they didn't want to shout across that 10 feet what they thought was going on because then they might give a clue to the couple next to them or something and so that element of not wanting to say something and not wanting to speak was a barrier to solving the mission here. And spiritual intimacy also kind of gets into that too, where sometimes we just, we come into it and we're afraid for whatever reasons to say what's on our mind, or we're afraid to come into it and say what's, you know, what we're thinking because of whatever reasons. You know, maybe this, is, maybe you're struggling with a spiritual question and your spouse would be a great person to, to pray with about that for you because this is a person you're the closest to and who cares the most about your spiritual life. But it takes time <laughs> to get to that point and it takes effort to get to that point where we feel comfortable opening up about these deep personal things that all of our lives we maybe have kept to ourselves. Um, also, um, different languages. That one, I don't know, did anybody experience it where like you were trying to communicate with your partner to solve this thing but one of you was going down one road thinking maybe like it's a numerical code and then the other one is thinking no it has something to do with the letters. Did anybody have that where you guys are trying to solve it in two different ways? Yeah? Yeah, okay, I see a few heads shaking. And that's, again, it's another aspect of our lives that we're trying to develop this closeness in our spiritual lives that brings us together under God, but sometimes we're coming at it from different ways. Maybe one of us is from a family that, you know, prays together regularly and reads the Bible together regularly and we, you know, we talk about spiritual issues and we read books or whatever, and then the other one is from one of the families that is more reserved about it and we just kind of, you know, tend to keep our own private spiritual lives in order and even though maybe we're we're perfectly strong spiritually, we're not necessarily aware of the impact that it has when we communicate with our spouse and we can come at it from different angles, just like trying to solve this code. You know, you're trying to develop this spiritual intimacy and you're not getting there and sometimes we don't realize that the problem is we're speaking different languages. We're coming at it from different angles and trying to accomplish it, but in different ways. This can happen often in terms of kind of familial upbringing. Let's say that the two of you came into the marriage from different spiritual, um, from the same church, okay, but from different spiritual traditions. Maybe in your home, you would read the Bible as a family once a month or twice a month or once a week. And maybe in your home, the other partner's home, you would make sure that the liturgy was first and foremost and that everybody would be there at the very beginning from the offering, right? Um, maybe then the two of you come together and you say, look, the most important thing is that we are present for the offering at the liturgy. That's the time we need to be there. We need to, we need to be there then. And the other person says, well, wait a minute. I, that's not 
that's not what I was raised with. And what's more important for me and what I was raised with is we, and how come we're not reading the Bible like I was raised? And the other person might say, well, how come we're not getting to the liturgy together by this time like I was raised? We begin to experience a little bit of a discord because of the way we're accustomed to worshiping, the way we're accustomed to reaching out and expressing love or commitment or obedience to God. We're not in unison. This is common. But it doesn't have to go on that way. One of the most common mistakes in a marriage is that husband will continue the way husband did before marriage and wife will continue the way wife did before marriage and the two will continue on their separate paths. Okay, if that's the way you need to worship, then you go take your car and you go and you be at the liturgy by the offering, but I'm going to stay back until I'm comfortable to go. And if that's the way you feel about reading the Bible, then you read the Bible by yourself once a week or twice a month, and I'm going to do my own thing, right? But that's not intimacy spiritually that God intended. The intimacy that God intended is not in only a personal intimacy with God, but also the two of you being intimate together in unison at the same time with God, right? You need to find, very practically speaking, the two of you need to find your common ground or you need to make common ground if you haven't already done so. You need to create new traditions. You need to decide for yourselves as husband and wife what you're going to do to become intimate spiritually, worshiping God together in unison, right? One of the worst things you can do, men or wives, is leave your partner behind. And that is the lesson of the movie Fireproof, and it is a counseling principle 101. Never leave your partner behind. Just as a firefighter who enters into a burning fire enters with his partner, he always has his eyes on his partner. No firefighter ever go fighter ever goes into a burning fire unwatched or alone. Everybody's accounted for at all times. Now, what is something that we tend to do? We tend to leave our partner behind because we think we're doing something good for God. For example, I decide that I'm going to serve as a deacon and I'm going to be there, you know, at 8.15 or 8 or 7.30 sharp every Sunday, right? That's good. I'm glad. But if I've done that before marriage, it's one thing. If, I've done, if I'm doing that after marriage and there are three kids in the house and those three kids need help getting dressed and they need to... I'm not going to jump in the car and get there and leave my wife with the three and have her do all the work and get them in a second car and drive them all the way to church and then we both go in, you know, and then she's in the back room dealing with them crying or chasing them down, right? And you had a great spiritual liturgy and you say, hey honey, how was your, how was your Sunday today? And you're like all happy and heavenly and she's like feeling like she wants to pull her hair out and she says, I don't think I had a very worshipful experience today. I basically fed the kids in the morning, got them dressed all by myself, got them in the car, took them out of the car, got them to the liturgy, chased them around, tried to take care of them, and you were up there by yourself. Right? That's one example of leaving your partner behind. Another example of leaving your partner behind is basically sitting in front of the computer f for two, three hours a day. When your wife needs you, what are you doing? You're sitting in front of the computer two or three hours a day serving God. You are reading Bible verses, reading articles, studying up on new hymns, you're, whatever it is you're doing, fill in the blank, right? But while you're doing that, again, your wife is doing stuff for the house, wishing you were helping her, wishing you were with her, wishing you were involving her, but she's not involved. And you think to yourself, she wouldn't be interested anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to keep going with my spiritual endeavor, my pursuit spiritually, and she can deal with it. And someday she'll catch up. I'll just pray for her. Someday she'll catch up. But she won't catch up. She won't catch up because you left her behind. And just to be fair, it can go both ways too. You know, we can have the opposite scenario where the wife is serving and serving, serving whatever, you know, you name it, uh, Sunday school or, you know, 
cooking for the church on Sunday or um, attending lots of meetings or helping out with the preschool classes or whatever, you know, and, and we've seen this too before where, you know, the wife is serving and serving and serving and the husband is saying, you know what, I love it that you're doing this. This is all really good. It's really important this work that you're doing, but, but I need some time too. And that's, I think, the whole point of that part of this discussion is that none of these things in and of themselves are bad, but when they're taking away from the time that you and your spouse need to be spending developing your spiritual lives together, going before God together as a couple and growing together in Christ, if, you're if your activities as an individual are taking away from that time, then that's where we have a problem, and that's one of the barriers to spiritual intimacy. Listen, there are times when people, women would say to me, Abuna, he does this, this, and this. Or, or a husband would say, Abuna, she does this, this, and this, and this. She comes home after church at 3 or 4 o'clock. I'm tired. I'm hungry. This is my day off, and I feel all alone. We take separate cars. She goes, and I go. I like to come home at 1. She likes to come home two and a half hours later, and I feel all alone. Is this sounding familiar? You see? <laughs> you... Or you can answer silently. <laughs> Whatever you like. <laughs> These are things that every marriage counselor has heard before, and Uncle Atif is the uh, is, is a the, our 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 marriage counselor from day one. All of us in the community, we hear this all the time. You know that sometimes the devil can turn the pursuit of God into the very thing that separates you and drives a wedge between you because you don't do it right we need to pursue God with our partners not in spite of them not to spite them and not despite them we need to pursue God with our partners if you feel that you are a little more advanced in one area of your spiritual walk you need to look back look behind you look who you passed that's your spouse that's the one that God made you one with in the sacrament you have to go back and slow down. It is better that you slow down and do less and go back and take care of your wife and bring her up to a, a speed that the two of you can go at together and that you grow together. That achieves spiritual intimacy. That pleases God. That is essential. Be very careful about this. It's a vital principle and it happens all the time. That's another common illustration of a barrier. Let's move on want to share something with you now. <clears throat> what you must never forget is the pyramid principle. You've heard us speak about this last year and it bears repeating. In spiritual intimacy in marriage, God must be number one. Number one. Your spouse must be number two. Number two. Your God and your spouse and you are in unison. The children and everyone else and everything else comes after that. That's the order. Another impediment to spiritual intimacy can be children because sometimes we find that we can accidentally begin to put the children's needs ahead of our husband's needs or ahead of God's expectations from us and we get out of balance, out of whack. We must always be careful to put God first then our spouse second, and then everyone else and everything else, like your job, whatever it may be, your career, after that. That is a very practical lesson, and it bears um, application. Take the time, the two of you, to assess whether you are living this way. If you are both in agreement that you should live this way, theoretically, take the time to assess how close you're coming to that theoretical objective. Honey, do you feel that I put God first in our relationship and that I put you second? Do you feel that my job doesn't come ahead of you? Do you feel that, you know, fill in the blank doesn't come ahead of you? Or do you feel otherwise? Now, this gentleman takes a lot of courage because you might not get an answer that you like and you might even expect an answer you don't like, but that shouldn't discourage you from entering into the conversation. The purpose of conversation is to heal and to bring closer. And sometimes when you try to do that, it, it's a little wounding, 
but after those expressions of emotion are vetted, you will find that you can get closer and you can really achieve intimacy. Any thoughts on why we're saying that God should be number one and spouse should be number two and not the other way around? Like, does that sound consistent from what you thought going into marriage? Don't you think you're going to be the first person or first thing in this person's whole life, your, their first priority, even if we kind of know God is supposed to be first? But are we really expecting that or are we expecting that they're going to put us first? What do you guys think? I think it goes back to um, the marriage has to include God as that common bond. So if God isn't first, there's no common bond between you and them through God. So it, it's not. But you could be like the same personality. You could have all the same interests. You could be the best of friends. You could like you could come from similar backgrounds. You could have tons of things in common, and you could have lots of common ground. But why does God have to be first? Um, I think it goes back. Maybe it comes, comes to like your purpose. If your purpose is to please God and to build a church in your house, then God has to be first. Um, another way to look at it, a practical way to look at it, is it's more of a guarantee that if God is first, you know that nothing can separate you because Thanks. that's a common bond. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I was once told by somebody before I married him that he was going to um, always love God before he loved me. And, you know, coming from a background where I wasn't necessarily raised in a Christian home and I was kind of, you know, new to Christianity in the past five years or so before we got married, it was a little bit shocking to me that he said that, but then he clarified it and he said, I'm going to love God always more than I love you because there are going to be times when I'm going to be unlovable and if you love God more than you love me, then I know you're not going to leave and I know you're not going to give up and I know you're always going to continue to fight for this relationship and so that's what I'm going to do for you too. He said to me, I'm going to love God more than I love you so that in those times when you're not lovable, my love for God will override whatever's going on between the two of us and I'm not going to give up on you and I'm not going to leave you and I'm never going to lose hope that our relationship can be all that God wants it to be. But I wasn't crazy enough to say, when you're not unlovable. Actually, I think he did. <laughs> I think he repressed it. <laughs> That's all right. He said other good stuff, too. Don't worry. We'll give you better quotes than I that. I must have sandwiched it really well with lots of confidence. I still married him. <laughs> Do you know when married couples have difficulty in their marriage and they're really struggling? and they're having a terrible time. And then they start to utter the D word, which is a word that's not allowed in a Christian marriage, or the S word, which is akin to the D word. Divorce, separate. <laughs> Just to clarify. <laughs> if the couple says, I will never divorce my spouse because of the children, nine times out of 10, the marriage will fail. You think about that, that's pretty powerful. When a couple says, one, one of the spouses say, I will never ever leave my husband or my wife because of my children, usually the children are not enough to keep a couple together. But when a couple says, I will never ever separate or divorce my wife because of my love for God, that marriage, nine times out of 10, stands. It weathers the storm. God is your glue. It's not your children. I'm sorry to say it. It's the fact. We have to come to terms with it. As much as you love the children and as much as you're concerned for the children, the children are not enough to keep you together. And if you don't believe me, look at the rest of the country. Look at the rest of the world. Look at the people in our own community that did divorce or separate and ask them, did you say something about children? They'll tell you, yeah. God is the one who will get you through. And he is the reason you stay with your spouse. Because of your love for him. Because of your obedience to him. That's an essential principle. God is number one. Spouse is number two. Everyone and everything else follows after that. We've got a video we want to share with you on higher love. And there are some principles about spiritual intimacy we thought you'd like to hear from someone else other than just us doing all the talking all the time. Some of these faces 
might look familiar from previous videos. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Dr. Greg Smalley, and welcome to Focus on the Family's Essentials of Marriage series. In this session, we will hear from several speakers, Stormy Omardian, best-selling author of The Power of a Praying Wife, Dr. Gary and Barb Rosberg, America's Family Coaches, Dr. Les and Leslie Parrott, authors of Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, and Gary Thomas will join us again. They all discuss the value of praying together as a couple. There is probably no other thing that you can do to build intimacy in your relationship with each other. I know for many men, this may seem difficult or even impossible, but trust me, you can do it. You may need to start with something very simple like praying for each other separately and then sharing what you prayed about in an email or in a note, whatever you feel comfortable with. Later in this session, the parents refer to marriage mentoring. The big takeaway in this session from their interview is how important it is that we not only pray together as a couple, but we also find ways to serve the Lord together. I know for a fact that these things work. The best news is they don't have to be big things. They can be small acts of service. Trust me, ministering together will so enhance your lives and deepen the intimacy with one another. The most powerful thing a couple can do together is to pray and worship. Now the thing is, God made husband and wife to be one. And what you're doing is exercising that oneness when you're agreeing in prayer together and worshiping together. There's a, it's a dynamic that is, uh, I think it's way underestimated because the power of the two of you praying together is, is beyond what we think it is. We have been given authority in prayer as husband and wife praying together that we, we don't really understand the full uh, magnitude of it yet, I don't think. Because I think if we did, there is just nothing that would, would stand against us as we pray together. And I've seen it in my own marriage where, where we've had times of, of, of trouble. And we, my husband and I came into the mar our marriage as broken people. And my husband came in with a lot of anger from his childhood. I came in with a lot of hurt from my childhood. And those two things together created so much friction between us. But we found that when we could just get beyond that and pray together, just overlook our differences or overlook how we would react to each other and pray together in power, we would see that thing lift off of us. Any kind of strife would just lift off of us and dynamic things would happen and we saw that we were better together than we were apart, even in prayer. And so it's a powerful dynamic and, pr and praying, praising God together is, is, is so powerful. It's, a, it's a, that corporate worship just between the two of you, but it's a powerful dynamic. I don't think the enemy can prevail against that in any way because you have opened up your hearts and yourselves to the power of God flowing into your life and that's a, it's a power that is greater than anything you face. We want to pause here on this principle. How many of you think it's possible that we could come into a marriage with baggage or wounds? Yeah. It's true. When you get married, you don't come all fixed up. You come with your history. You didn't leave that at home, right? You didn't separate that. You brought it into the relationship, right? Your dreams came with you, but so did your fears, right? Your strengths came with you, but so did your weaknesses. Everything that you were ever concerned about is with you. And every injury that you ever sustained is upon you. Now I want to ask you all something. How many of you spouses can, can, can really, now this is rhetorical, how many of you spouses can really say, I know the wounds of my spouse. I know what they are. They're not the wounds that I inflicted. I know the wounds that my spouse sustained when I was not in his or her life. Right? If you say yes, if the answer is affirmative, you're in great shape. That means you've had intimate conversations and you understand the sensitivity and the vulnerability of your spouse. Now, your spouse is going to share these things principally with you because she or he trusts you. But what you have to be careful to do is to honor that trust and never use that knowledge to deepen the wound. And 
because of that sensitivity, you must be extra careful to be sensitive when you communicate verbally or non-verbally with your spouse because you have knowledge of the wound. Now, you treat your spouse with loving care because that's how you want to be treated too. And because your spouse knows your weaknesses. Your spouse knows your wounds. We all come into the marriage wounded. We need to acknowledge that and understand it. And sometimes in achieving spiritual intimacy, we need to have a conversation about it. Now, having said that, <clears throat> what Stormy says, you can pray through those wounds and God in the sacrament of marriage can heal you. Over time, your spouse can be an agent of love and nurture to, to minister God's care to you, to you, right? That comes from you because you're in Christ and Christ is a healer and you are his agent of healing. You're his agent of love. You're his agent of care. You can pray together about those wounds. You can pray for your spouse concerning those wounds. And when you do pray for your spouse, you develop something called empathy, which we'll talk about more tomorrow. Um, the other thing that I wanted to comment, and does anybody, did anybody know she said that we found that we were better together than we were apart even in prayer? Yeah, do you, you caught that? Have, has anybody here ever experienced that, where you find that like you're trying to pray for something on your own, you just whatever reasons, you, you're not able to get through it, maybe your mind is wandering or whatever, and then you sit down with your spouse and all of a sudden you're praying and you're hearing like these thoughts and these concerns and these words coming out of your mouth and you feel like God is really present with you in a way that he wasn't when you were trying to pray for it alone. Has anybody ever kind of had that, had that experience or similar? Yeah, I see a few heads shaking. Um, which is another thing, you know, she said in the very beginning that we're given a power through prayer that we don't really understand. And there's something special about marriage. You know, we've been made one in marriage, and yet we're still kind of fitting that category of two being gathered together in his name. And so there's something really powerful and special about praying together as a couple with your spouse that often makes your prayer better than it is on your own and that's something that we really need to shoot for in marriage is that comfort level of praying with each other about everything and anything that we need to when you're in conflict and you pray together you will find that the power of god's spirit is going to help you to resolve your conflict you can bring your conflicts to god now here's what you don't want to do okay listen oh lord my wife's a sinner <laughs> She's disrespectful. She's rude. Please she's help my husband to be a better man. <laughs> Please help him to get over this habit he has with the computer. <laughs> and she doesn't listen. And You see, that's not real prayer. That's preaching to your wife as though she can't hear you. Doesn't work. What you can do if you're in a conflict, let's say you're in a conflict about, you know, how to, how to discipline the children. Right? You disagree on how the two of you are disciplining children. Right? You sit down and you pray together and you say, God, please give us wisdom. We're your servants and you've blessed us with these children. And we don't know how to take care of them apart from your grace and your wisdom and your knowledge. Teach us from your word. Give us wisdom and bless us with your spirit. Though we may disagree at this time, God, we submit to you ultimately. We submitted to you in the beginning and we continue to submit to you. We will look to your instructions. We will look to your word. Your word is finite. Your word is the final word. And that's where we will seek your guidance, Lord. We will seek your guidance in the church, Lord. We will seek your guidance from our spiritual fathers. We pray that you speak through the church. We pray that you speak through our spiritual fathers. We have an appointment with a spiritual father to discuss this, Lord. We pray that you would be present and prepare us and guide us. Lord, provide us resources, Christian resources. Fill us with knowledge. You see, what we're doing is we're together asking God for something to help us to, degree, to come to terms of agreement. And by the end of that prayer, we have a common goal. Yeah, and just to sit down together and just to remember that this is not my enemy and I'm not his enemy. Even if we're in a conflict, we're just two of God's children and we're asking for his help to figure this out because we don't know what to do. It's amazing how much peace that can bring when you think about it that way. That God can solve anything and you're just his children sitting down together asking him for help. Comment or question in the corner. Can we get a mic over there? 
I guess, I mean, theoretically, I can understand what you're saying about the importance um, and the power of praying through conflict. But for me personally, I feel like if I'm in conflict, um, I don't want to, like, I feel like prayer is, like, almost as intimate a thing as physical intimacy. And just as I would not want to be physically intimate with my spouse when I'm when I'm in a conflict, the last thing I want to do is pray with them because it's just as close. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how. Yeah, I hear you. And I don't think that we're saying necessarily right in the middle of a brawl <laughs> to just, right in the middle of a brawl to just, um, you know, drop everything and it's pray. Working. Although, although that is, you know, sometimes the right thing. I don't. I think. I don't think we're necessarily saying that's exactly what you have to do, but it, you could wait till it cools down a little bit, and you know, maybe in that time when you're you're still kind of not feeling resolved, but you're cooled down and you're not so angry, maybe that's a good time to do it. Or you know, like every 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 couple kind of knows their limits, I think, or you learn your limits over time. But I think, and it's not just conflict either, too. I think we're also focusing on that. But conflict is not the only thing that we're talking about. Sometimes it's a problem that you both agree is a problem, and you're not in conflict with it, but you need help. Um, so there are a lot of other scenarios also where we're talking about this, too. Yeah. If you pray together in the good times on a regular basis, you're going to find it easier to pray together during the hard times. You didn't pray together in the heat of the, your conflict. In fact, it, if the conflict gets to be too hot, you table that. You reschedule the conversation so as to avoid escalation, and then you come together later. If things cool down between that time and the time you've rescheduled your conversation, that's a good time to pray. Or after your follow-up conversation is concluded, that's a good time to pray too. But pray and don't shy away from going to God who brought you together and made you one. Because you're asking God. You're delivering a concern to the one who provides peace which surpasses all understanding. That's a promise that God gives us, right? Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. And the peace which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4. This is essential, and it's a promise of God. You get peace. You get peace. At a minimum, you get peace. I'm going to go on now to the second segment and share with you a couple of other insights from a, some, a few of our uh, good speakers you know, praying together. I think one of the main benefits of praying for your spouse is that it creates empathy. I find when I just spend time in the morning putting my wife's day in front of the Lord and I see the challenges she has up ahead, all of the tasks she has to do, what it does is it gives me empathy for her. I'm praying for God's strength. I'm praying for God's wisdom. And it's, it really reminds me of the difficulties she faces. So often I find when expectations are weighing a marriage down, we're so aware of our challenges and our stresses and our burdens and completely unaware of what our spouse faces. And prayer, I've just found, is a very effective tool to get me to see the day through my wife's eyes. And I really think, particularly as men, I'd like to challenge them to do it more often. Yeah, I've met men that will bow hunt elk or moose, which, which can be rather dangerous. I mean, it takes, a, it takes a good degree of guts if you're bow hunting for moose, and yet they're too afraid to pray with their wives. And, and it amazes me. If, if, I think if they knew what it would do for their wives, I've had in some seminars where I'll just have men pray for their wives, and some wives will come up and say it's the first time their husband has ever prayed for them, and they are just weeping. It means so much for them. And so it's really, prayer is, is a great blessing. You're living this life together. You're inviting God's presence. You're inviting God into the marriage. You're letting God open up your eyes to give you empathy for your spouse. Uh, it's just a great thing to do and it's completely free. One time my wife suggested, you know, there's so many ways. The first three sessions of this DVD really focused on helping us to see our marriage differently to understand God's design for our marriage. Marriage really is designed not only to connect us deeply to each other, but also to connect us to our Creator. In this session, we saw how important praying for and with each other can be, as well as how serving each other can deeply connect us to our spouse and to our Father.
You know, praying out loud can really be uncomfortable for some people. It's okay to have that fear. Anything new can seem awkward at first. I encourage you to at least take a stab at it. It's not going to be perfect. As a matter of fact, I remember one time that Aaron and I, kind of when we pray together, is usually at night before we go to bed. So we're, we're just having some sweet couple time, just, just praying with and, and for one another. When all of a sudden, the most demonic voice that we'd ever heard in our entire life came out of the baby monitor. I mean, it literally sounded like Satan is having a conversation with our daughter. So, of course, we jump up, look at each other, not sure what to do, what we're going to find in there. I mean, I remember racing into a room prepared to, you know, battle the forces of darkness. And as we got in there, we find our sweet little Taylor um, who's sitting in her crib with her little praying bunny. It was this bunny that when you pressed her little arm, she would run through a series of bedtime prayers. So it's supposed to be this neat little praying bunny, but the batteries had worn down. So all you were getting was what sounded like a total demonic voice. And so you're going to get interrupted. Things aren't going to be perfect. It doesn't have to be eloquent or wordy. It can simply be expressing to God how thankful we are to God for each other. But I encourage you both to start either praying for each each other or with each other. Spiritual disciplines like praying together and serving together can really bind you closer together and take your marriage to the next level. Has anybody ever had that experience with the praying toys when the batteries start to go low? Have you guys ever had that? <laughs> this is why I hate those toys, because they sound so horrible when the batteries start to go low, but by then the kid is attached to the thing. God forbid you should take it away until you can get some proper batteries in the thing. They freak out. <laughs> it's the worst thing ever. Um, so the first speaker, what was his name? G Gary? The first Gary, speaker? Yeah. yeah, Gary. One of the things um, he was saying is, is talking about sort of starting out his morning praying for his wife and, and laying out her needs before the Lord in the morning, knowing full well the kind of challenges that she faces. That requires a couple of things. First of all, that requires that the couple is communicating and that they kind of know the struggles that you're going through. And that particular example really should go both ways too. Like if a, if a, if a husband is praying for his wife's needs, knowing what she's going through the day, the husband, should, or the husband should also have the assurance that his wife is doing the same. And I just wanted to emphasize that because sometimes I think when we're in these family conferences, we tend to overemphasize the struggles that women go through, especially if we have kids and we're staying home with them or, or maybe, um, you know, it's just a fact. It's, it's even statistically, you know, documented that women still tend to carry the larger burden of the household responsibilities. And it's true. And it needs acknowledgement. But at the same time, we also need to not forget that our husbands are out there facing the giants every day. And that, you know, we as wives also need to, to take that step and do like he was talking about and make sure that we're putting him before the Lord and his challenges and his needs, many of which he might not get a chance to talk to us about when he comes home at the end of the day because we might be too busy telling him about Junior throwing up on me and little Miss Muffet running around with no diaper on for the last five hours and, you know, all these things that we go through during the day that are kind of exasperating that are right there in front of us when the husband comes home that sometimes his needs get overlooked. So we just wanted to emphasize also that that, that this act of praying for each other and trying to keep in mind the challenges that your spouse is going through during the day, whether you're praying in the morning first thing or whether you're more of a nighttime quiet time person and you're praying for the next day or praying for what has happened this day, make sure that we're both doing that and that we're both really trying to consider what kind of challenges our spouse might be going through during the day. Yeah, Joe? I have a question. Um, so I, I, I obviously agree with, and um, you know, on board with spiritual in intimacy. Just want to make sure that in the concept of spiritual intimacy, is there still time, whether it's prayer or service, for you to do stuff on your own? Like, may, what if you have a a balance that, whatever it is, for sometimes we pray together. Maybe that's at night, maybe in the morning we pray individually, or whatever the setup is. Uh, same with service, we do serve some things together some things we do on our own. I mean, is Absolutely. that, is there, I don't know what the ratio is, but I mean, if you've yeah. gotten to the place in your marriage where you got it comfortable with the, that balance, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. It's vital, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it is vital. I mean, you know, uh, Debbie's not up there on the altar with me, you know, when I'm serving <laughs> God, right? right? See, that we all, we all, God has, God has basically expected from us a spiritual intimacy with Him, first and foremost, individually. But He wants us also to be doing it 
collectively. Now the thing is, that what's often neglected is the intimacy between husband and wife on a spiritual level. So we emphasize that here. But we don't do so uh, at the expense of our individual spiritual growth. So we serve God individually. We pray individually. And, and one thing I was just going to suggest, if you are at the point where you're not able to pray out loud with your spouse yet, what you might consider doing is praying individually for your spouse and then reporting to your spouse that you prayed for him or her on these specific issues. Honey, I know right now we're going through a, a round of layoffs at work. And every morning you go in there, you're wondering whether you're going to have to come home and tell me that you've been laid off. I want you to know that I understand that that's stressful. And I learned how stressful that is when I prayed for you this morning and yesterday morning and the morning before. I have been praying for you on this issue in particular. And I love you. You tell your spouse that you're praying for them specifically on these specific issues. And you can ask them, how can I pray for you during my quiet time with the Lord? And then that's a, a, a nice step in the direction of praying together as well. Yeah, and you'll see, you'll find definitely that, that the Holy Spirit really gets involved in that. There were so many times when he was a lawyer <clears throat> and, you know, God would put it on my heart when I was praying during the day and he was at work and I was at home with the kids or whatever, you know, just to pray about him, you know, maybe in even a generic sense, you know, like, I don't know, around 11 o'clock today, I just really felt like I wanted to pray for you at work or something and say, no kidding, really, because that's when I was in the middle of this massive argument with somebody about something and, you know, I was looking like I had messed something up and, you know, then it came out later, that, you know, like, and you would see that, like, you know, God had resolved some situation right around then. He said, you know, like, that was amazing that you were praying for me right then because I really needed it. And, and, you know, just to know that you have each other's back, you know. We can pray for each other and it's such, it, it builds intimacy. It builds emotional intimacy. It builds physical intimacy. It builds intimacy on all dimensions in our lives when we pray for each other and let each other know how much we love each other in that sense. Now, to get specific here before we take our break, how, how can we be spiritually intimate specifically? One, we've spoken about prayer, right? We've spoken about prayer. What does the Bible say about prayer? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, never stop praying. Never stop praying. Here's a suggestion for how you guys can pray, individually and as a couple. You've heard of this acronym, I think, ACTS. ACTS stands for Adoration you adore God by worshiping Him. You speak words of praise, confession. You confess your sin to Him. Thanksgiving, you thank Him for the things He's given you, the things He's done. Supplication, you ask Him for things, what you need. This is a nice little recipe that you can follow when you're going to pray from your heart, right? From your, from your heart, your mind, you're going to sit down and pray. You can follow this. You might find it helpful, right? You also are going to study God's Word together, right? We suggest that you study God's Word on a fixed interval. Determine as a couple when you're going to study God's Word. Are we going to do this once a week? Are we going to do it twice a week? Are we going to do it every night? Are we going to do it twice a month? First Friday of every month? Second Sunday after church? You decide. But fix an interval put it on the calendar, make it a commitment. Does it need to be an hour? No. It could be two minutes. It is better that you read God's Word together regularly for a short period of time than it is that you spend a two-hour period studying God's Word and never pick up the Bible again until your 15th or 20th year after that. Right? What you want to do is set up for yourself a goal that's sustainable and doable and that is not intimidating or discouraging. And you'll find that when you start your habit and you conduct that habit for 40 days, you're going to find that after 40 intervals, you're going to be able to raise the bar a little bit for yourselves as a couple. Start small. Take very small baby steps. Read God's Word together. Spend time in God's Word. And then secondly, we suggest that you do it in meditation. <clears throat> what happens when you sit down at a buffet and you shovel in your mouth everything that you have on your plate? You go back for more and you shovel it in your mouth. 
you go home and you have indigestion. Your body cannot digest all the stuff that you jammed in in a short period of time, right? But if you take, <coughs> excuse me, if you had taken a smaller portion and chewed it slowly and enjoyed it over a longer period of time, you will have enjoyed it and your body can digest it with, with ease. In the same way, take God's word and meditate on it. Digest it. Think about it. Talk about it together. Hey, the Bible says, do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 44. Okay, what does that mean for us? Who was Jesus speaking to? Why did he say what he said? Was he quoting scripture of another sort? What did he mean? How can we apply this to our lives? What do you think it means, do not live by bread alone? If we're going to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, does that mean that we need to spend more time knowing every word that proceeds from the mouth? You see, talk about it, unpack it, consider its significance, apply it. Yeah, Quanti quantity is not as important as quality. You know, if you take the time to really digest it, you know, if you read, if you read a whole chapter at a time, sometimes you're going to do that because sometimes you're in a chapter where you just really, you know, feel like you want to keep moving and you're, you're enjoying it. Other times, sometimes you get hung up on one or two sentences and you say, oh my gosh, I never really thought about it that way. And, and there's all this stuff in that one verse or those two verses or that one little paragraph that all of a sudden that day God is using to speak to you in a way that he's never done before. So don't get focused on like the goal orientation of making sure that you get through you know this one book you know this week or today or whatever just take your time to really digest it thoroughly it's not about checking something off on your list this is time in God's Word because you love God and you believe that God is gonna speak to you as a couple through the words that you're gonna put your eyes to on the page you can say a prayer before you start reading the, the Bible together God bless us and teach us teach us what you want us to apply and learn from your word tonight or this morning, or today, whatever the case may be. And you get into it, and you read it together, and you enjoy it, and you think about it. You're going to feel so blessed, and you're going to feel richer with knowledge, and you're going to feel closer emotionally when that time period is over. And it doesn't need to be long, and it doesn't need to be a lot of verses. We spent a little bit of time right now together on Matthew 4, 44. And that little amount of time is going to be a greater blessing than no time. I promise you that. Thirdly, oh, before we get on to thirdly, this is an encouragement from 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God. In other words, what's my motivation? Why do I read God's word? All right. St. Paul was speaking to Timothy, a young bishop. St. Timothy was to convey and teach his people, the people that he was looking over. He's saying, look, teach the people that all scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. It's useful. It's teaching us what is true. It helps us to realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. That's why we read the scriptures. Because we want to know when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. Listen, if we don't read the Bible and know what it says, we're prone, we're, 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 we're destined to listen to society. And society is shaped by media. And media comes from Hollywood. And those people are totally lost. They don't know their left hand from their right hand. I don't know what Tom Cruise is worshipping or doing today. And I don't know how Brad Pitt came to Angelina Jolie. And then I, I don't know what they, they are teaching the, the country in their acting and in their platitudes in the media. And we follow them. And Oprah and Oprah-isms and all the people that Oprah hosts are teaching the world about what's right and what's wrong. But if we don't know how to compare all that stuff to God's word, we're bound to follow the crowd. We need to know what's wrong in our lives. We need to know what we need to do right. And that's what 2 Timothy is teaching us. And that's why we read God's word. Three, we serve God together. We mentioned this. We can serve God creatively with the gifts that he's given us. He gave us spiritual gifts. Why don't we use those gifts? I'm not saying that every one of you needs to be dressing as a deacon or a Sunday school teacher. Husband, deacon, wife, Sunday school teacher. Go to it. Everybody. We all have a bunch of deacons and all have a bunch of Sunday school teachers. And that's all we do. And we're all going to have, it's like a body with six arms. We, we don't need that. 
No. If we needed that, God would have made you all incredible deacons and incredible Sunday school teachers. But that's not what God wants. God wants you to look within you and see the gifts that He gave you when you were born. The gifts that He designed in you, like a designer, a creator, an inventor. I am going to work on Joe. I'm going to give him the gift of this and the gift of that. And he's going to be, I'm going to work on Marie. And the gift of this and the gift of that. And he does that. That's what he's got in you. Well, think about what you enjoy doing in your life. Think about what you love to do. And then turn to your husband and say, Honey, I love to bake. Honey, I love to build things. I, lo I, liked, I like wood. What can I do for God? Since I I've built all the stuff in our house, but... I don't feel like I'm using this, this love and this passion for God. And He gave it to me. How can I use it? Think about it. Talk about it. That's how you get creative ministries in your church that are sustainable ministries. That's how you make an impact. Listen, we have people in churches everywhere that are doing amazing things, not because Abuna said, hey, I want you to go take all of your pets to the neighborhood elderly place and show those pets to the elderly there. And then, you know, we don't, we don't do that. Servants come up to us and say, Abuna, I've been thinking a lot about this thing that I really enjoy doing. Would it be okay if? And we say, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear your initiative because the Holy Spirit has encouraged you to do it. And that's how you use God's gifts. That's what you want to do together and individually. And serve God with purpose, purposefully. You're not a drone. Once we went, um, <coughs> we went out, and we had a, a, an event. And basically, we wanted to find people who could simply greet folks in the parking lot. People coming into the church who are never come to church before, who are scared of church, who have all the church fear crazy people they think about us who worship in a funny way and speak funny language. We don't understand. We wanted greeters in the parking lot to just smile and say, you can park here. And when you get out of the car, you can walk over here. Welcome. Right? We could have picked anybody, but what we were looking for were people who purposefully wanted to greet people, make a first impression the first time with love, understanding that they are not merely parking attendants, they're ministers reaching out to people for the first time to make them feel welcomed and loved because this is the first impression of Jesus Christ. Hmm? That is a whole different level, a whole different level of being in the parking lot on a Saturday night wearing an orange jersey, right? With an umbrella if in necessary. In the rain. Right? See, that's what you want. Whatever you decide you can do, do it purposefully. Say, yeah, there's a purpose to this. I'm not just here, you know, um, passing out or bond. I'm doing it because there's a purpose, okay? Whatever it is, whatever it is you do, do it purposefully. Joshua 24, 24, we will serve the Lord our God. We will obey Him. Last but not least, the sacrament of confession is essential to your spiritual intimacy, okay? You do this with a spiritual father in the church. You confess your sin. When you hurt your spouse, you got to confess it. You say sorry to God. That's what confession is. It's when you come to God and you say, God, I'm sorry. I've sinned against you. I made it wrong. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to make it right. Okay? That's confession. But then, don't stop there. Go to repentance. Repentance is where you make it right. So, if I did something wrong and I say sorry to God, I'm good, but I have to make it right. That means I go over to the person that I hurt and I apologize to that person as well, not just to God, right? So if I hurt my spouse, I go to my spouse. After I confess to God, I say, I'm sorry for what I did and I want to make it right, right? If I took something that didn't belong to me, how do I make it right? I give it back, right? If I misstated something, how do I make it right? I restate it, right? Okay? Whatever it is, we repent. When we repent, we're strengthened. And then we won't do it again. Or we'll be less inclined to do it again. Some of us fall short and we only say sorry to God. And then we have difficulty. We come back and confess the same thing again and again and again. And we wonder why. Part of the... The, the blessing of repentance is it stings a little bit to repent, but when you do it, you, re, you appreciate 
the implications of what you've done. It teaches us humility. It teaches us how to be vulnerable. When you learn that humility and that vulnerability in the sacrament of confession, you, you practice it in your marriage because there are times you have to say, I messed up, honey, right? I messed up. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry for how it made you feel. We, we'll talk about, we'll review the forgiveness exercise maybe tomorrow. And sometimes with vulnerability, it's also not about sin. Sometimes it's about fears or anxieties or worries or dreams that we have. And sometimes we feel afraid to go to our spouse with that kind of stuff because it's very intimate. That's very vulnerable. That's exposing a part of ourselves and we don't know how they're going to accept it. The, the practice of confession really gives us an opportunity to, to, to kind of take a baby step in that direction with somebody that we already know is not going to judge us. We already know is not going to gossip about us. We already know is not going to turn it back on our face and go, you know, like you're crazy. What's wrong with you? How could you think that? Because Abuna doesn't do that. So it's a really good kind of a practice ground for introducing that vulnerability into your marriage that's really critical for all kinds of intimacy in your marriage. So it's a really good, um, it, it's really critical that we keep maintaining that, that practice of confession for so many reasons other than just getting rid of, you know, the sins that we've committed in our, in our marriage. The power of confession will change you. Don't be afraid to go to confession. Don't be afraid of what your father the priest is going to think of you. He's not to think of you. He's not to judge you. He, he goes through a lot of time and effort to try very, very hard to come and love you as Jesus Christ loves you. And he knows that he can't judge you. So don't assume that he's going to judge you. But come and speak as though you're speaking to God and he will be as a witness for you and administer to you something that Jesus Christ asked us to administer, which is forgiveness, right? Absolution, okay? And if you summarize what we've spoken about on how we can be spiritually intimate with our spouses, we, we do so by prayer, by studying God's word, by serving God together, by confessing. Now, we do this alone. We do this with our spouses. We do this with our family, like our children, or our mom and our dad. We do this with friends. We do this in fellowship, or small groups, and we do this liturgically, right? We do it in all facets of our daily worship, our weekly worship, our time together with God. This is the beauty of your Orthodox faith. It's something that we do on a regular basis. Spiritual intimacy is a blessing that God gives us. It's something we want to work hard towards. Just want to uh, close in a, in a song and then do a couple of exercises before we wrap up the night. I hope you'll enjoy this. <laughs> Father, I said till death do us part I want to mean it with all of my heart Help me to love you more than I love her Then I know I can love her more
if you come into your marriage every day praying for your spouse with all of your heart and praying together with all of your heart, you're going to find that God blesses you in a huge way. Your problems are going to feel like they're not insurmountable. Your, your, your future, your hope, your purpose as a couple is going to be more clear. And God's plan for your life is going to be more evident. I encourage you to do it. And you're going to be blessed. You know, um, we thought we'd come out with an exercise to, to encourage you guys. Um, and we've got a couple of things. Um, I'm going to ask Sam to pass around um, a piece of paper that we're going to go over together in small group. Um, bef uh, while he's doing that, do you all have Bibles on your cell phones or do we have Bibles with us? Sam, do we have Bibles? A few. Is there anybody who does not have a Bible on a cell phone? Everybody's got almost a Nobody? Okay. All right. How many Bibles do we have? We have five Bibles, so we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. What I want to ask you to do is get with your partner and pull up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look at three verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to encourage you right now to have a couple's Bible study. If anybody is still waiting on a spouse, uh, we're going to come and join. We're going to come and join. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18. They are three small verses. Before, before you have your little mini Bible study right now, this is going to be a three-minute or five-minute Bible study max, I want you to bow your head, and we're going to say a prayer. We're going to ask God to teach us something. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear God, we're your servants. We love you. We ask that you would bless us and teach us from your word on these words in verses 16, 17, and 18 so that we'll be blessed by you. Help us, give us wisdom, and teach us to apply your words, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of verse you can pray together before you start reading. Now I'm going to ask each of you to sit down and look at these verses together in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, all the way to 18. Read them out loud together. Talk about them. The last question that you ask each other should be, so how can we apply this? Then talk about how you can apply it. All right? Go. Okay. This was a mini Bible study. If you can imagine doing this for such a short time with your spouse, every night before you go to bed, or every morning before you start your day, or every day right after dinner, or right before dinner, whatever works for your schedules. There is a time during the day where the two of you are in the same house during the week. Once a week, most of you on a regular basis are in the same house at the same time. And if you want to put God first and you want to study his word together, do this. Just like this. Questions you can ask. Rejoice always. What does that mean? Does St. Paul really want us to be fake happy? What's he mean by that? You can talk about it. Is there a difference between happiness and joy? How come he doesn't say be happy always? What's the difference between happiness and rejoicing, right? These are conversations you can have. Well, I think happiness is like kind of something that's more temporary, but rejoicing can be something that's more enduring, right? Well, then he says pray without ceasing. How do I do that? How do you do it? I don't, I don't do it. Well, I don't do it either, but how, how should you talk about it, right? Work through it. Ask yourself the obvious questions. Ask yourselves the tough questions. In everything, give thanks. Hey, are we thankful enough? When we pray, do we thank God for the little things that we take for granted? 
our health, our drinking water, all those things. Talk about just like that. And you'll find that God will bless you. These are instructions from God and His Holy Spirit. When we talk about them, they're reinforced in our minds and our hearts and our daily lives. And then when I go to work, I not only remember what God taught me individually, I also, I also remember what, you know, what my wife and I spoke. And you know what? One of the neatest things is when you're connected to God and your spouse is connected to God, sometimes God can speak to you through your spouse. And that's pretty cool. Sometimes you'll miss something or you'll hear something from your spouse that really resonates from you and answers a prayer. Why? Because you took the time to come together in Christ's name. Where did Jesus say? Where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I. So you're coming together with your spouse and then you hear God's voice spoken through your spouse. Sometimes that's a real, real blessing. So I encourage you guys to do this on a regular basis. Now, we are intent on finishing on time. I want to have you take a look at the piece of paper that we circulated. In the interest of time, we won't actually break up into small groups. But let's just take some time to read these questions out loud together. And we'll run through them. Can I get somebody to read question one out loud? Volunteer. Under finding yourself. Sure, you right. volunteer? Sure. Okay. What's your spouse's response when, your spouse's response when you hear that spouses, spouses should pay together? <laughs> <laughs> what's your response when you hear that spouses should pay together and start family? Okay. What's your response when you hear that spouses should pray together? First thing, that's for super spiritual people. Second thing, we tried that, but it didn't work out for us. Third one, it would feel forced and fake. The fourth, I know we should, but we never get around to it. The fifth, we do it and I'm glad or other. Thanks, Sherry. Okay, take a moment with your spouse, answer the question. Check off on the boxes. If more than one apply, check them off. Okay, on this question, we're just curious. Raise your hand if you're in agreement about, don't tell us what your answers are, but raise your hand if you're in agreement about your answer as a couple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about half. Maybe even a little more. It's very good, very interesting. If you're not in agreement about the answer, that itself is a subject for discussion, right? And if you're in agreement about, you know, the awkwardness of prayer or there's some guilt about not praying, that's something to discuss also. This piece of paper is for you to take home and this is for future conversation as, a, as husband and wife or conversation tonight before you go to bed. The idea is that you talk about these questions and see what you can do to apply them. Question in the back. Can we have a microphone? So 
So I kind of wanted to sneak this answer in before Mariana walks in, but she did too late. Uh -huh. so, so, I mean, I guess my answer to the first question is, um, yes, we pray together. Mariana loves it. And boy, when I wanna, when I, if I want to buy something or get something approved, yeah, we pray together because she <laughs> makes her very happy. But my issue with it is I feel that I can, I can open up more to God if I am one-on-one -on -one with God than if I'm praying with my wife, you know, in, 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 sp in the spoken words and, and, you know, out loud. What do you think? Well, that's a great concern. Thank you for raising it, and I appreciate the, the honesty, too. That's very helpful for everybody. You know, you're not the only one. And the fact that you can open up more to God on the issue alone shouldn't hinder you from trying with your spouse, right? Remember that, you know, with God, you have complete freedom to express, I mean, you know, it's not like God doesn't know what you're thinking anyway. So you have complete freedom, right? But when you're praying with your spouse and she hears you praying about the issue, it brings her comfort. And the advantage that you may have noted is that, you, let's say you're praying about something that you want to buy, right? Um, it was a good example. You know, I want to buy the 60-inch, the you know, widescreen TV and it's the latest thing, and you're praying about that decision together, right? <clears throat> One of the advantages to praying about it with your spouse is after a time, your spouse might share with you a feeling, a concern, or an opinion. Well, you prayed about it with her, so when she speaks that concern, you're going to listen carefully because you know that God could be speaking to your wife and asking her to convey to you a sentiment that you haven't considered, haven't been willing or haven't been able to consider. There are so many times when we men put blinders on and get so excited about the next investment or the next project or the next thing that God gives up on us. He's, he's not listening to me. I'm going to speak to his wife. She's going to listen to me. And maybe she can help convey my message, right? So that's a great advantage. There are other advantages too, but one important point is that God made you one. You're praying about it. Ha having said that, don't also feel that because you already prayed about it with your spouse, you're not able or permitted to pray about it more individually. On the contrary, your spouse wants you to pray about it more individually on your own. Continue to pray and come back and report to your spouse what you're feeling about the continuing prayer and let her know what you've prayed about if it's fitting. I, I actually think it's just fine too because if you remember, I, I don't know if you guys were here yet then, but we had a slide and we were talking about order of priorities. God is number one, spouse is number two, everyone and everything else comes after that. And that when we were talking about that, we were talking about it in terms of how we spend our time and so on, but it, also it should be in your intimacy spiritually. You should be number one with God. God should be always the one that you are the most comfortable with above all. And your spouse should be, you know, you, you want as much intimacy with your spouse as you can have. But by all means, if you're not comfortable praying about something with your spouse, pray about it anyway, because that's you and God, which has always got to be number one. So there's no problem. Follow up, Zach? Follow up? Or are you reserving? Um. No, it, it just again, it seems very unfair of me to do to her because I know she will agree to anything I bring up if we pray together, you see. Um, he uses prayer, he uses prayer as Public well. confession, Zach, was... Uh, <laughs> Public confession was good back in the old days. Uh, that was no, a that's uh, very admirable. I, really, that's terrific. That's, uh, yeah. Thanks. So what you're saying is you use prayer to manipulate your wife. Is that what you're trying to say? I don't think so. I, I, I got, I got, no, I don't think that's at all. All right, next question. Next question. <laughs> let's, look at, let's look at number two and then skip to number four for time. Who can we ask to read number two, please? Volunteers to read number two. Maggie. God involved in a service project, what would you 
What would you want it to be, why? Serving food in a soup kitchen? Visiting people in a nursing home? Protesting an injustice? Going on a mission trip to another country? Short and sweet, other. <coughs> So take a couple minutes, discuss. Okay, so same question as before. Um, anybody, well, we'll flip it around this time. Anybody disagree between the two of you on what would be your ideal mission? Your, okay, <coughs> couple hands. All right, anybody surprised at what your spouse chose that you never, you know, any of those moments of like, hey, I never thought you'd want to do that? Anybody? Okay, no surprises. All right, that's good. So again, you know, in the whole topic of spiritual intimacy, this question is just sort of highlighting, you know, there are ways that our spirituality is going to manifest itself as we're serving God individually or together. And this one, if it was going to be a project that we were going to be doing together, it should be something that we can ideally agree on. It might not be my ideal project. It might be more your ideal project. But as long as I'm willing to go out there and go with you and experience this and give it a try or vice versa, or it could be something that we're totally unified on and we do both are fully invested in this mission, on this um, service project, either way, whatever. As long as it's something that is a tool to help us bring ourselves closer to God and closer to each other at, at the same time. Okay. Um, and the last one I think we'll do for tonight is number four. Can somebody please read that for us? What do you think is your spouse's most urgent prayer request right now? If you can't answer this question, how do you feel about that? All right, so everybody take a moment. I guess obviously this one you wouldn't want to do together. Take a moment to figure it out and then we'll share, your sp share it with your spouse and see if, you th if you're right. Okay, by now you should be trading back and forth if you haven't already. So this question is designed to make you think right? Wow. I wonder if I know what my wife or my husband's most urgent spiritual need is right now. And if I don't know, is it because I haven't been attuned? Or is it because he or she hasn't been comfortable to share it? Or a combination of the two? That's the purpose of the question. Ask. Discuss. Think about that. You want to make yourself readily open and available to your spouse. And you want to be able to pray for your spouse. And if your spouse is shy or unwilling to tell you, you need to understand why that is. 
right? There are some things, of course, that as husband and wife, you're going to reserve and say, look, this is something I'm, I need to pray about individually, just me and God for a while. You know, that's okay. That's no problem. But the concern comes when there's something I wish you knew. There's something I wish I could tell you. Or there's something I have been telling you over and over and over again and you keep missing. Then you want to be able to visit that in conversation. Thank you all very much for your kind attention. And this is going to conclude tonight's session. Before we wrap up, um, Debbie and I uh, wanted to make ourselves available for about 30 minutes. Um, we could sit here um, afterwards, um, put the, ch the chairs in a, in a circle or so, and we're open for, available for any kind of questions at all about anything having to do with marriage, family, whatever. And we're happy to answer questions or have a conversation. We'll be around for the next half hour or so to hang out with you. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you.